So today I'm taking a look at the TerraMaster F8 SSD Plus. This is an all NVMe network attached storage. It sports this relatively small enclosure, 10 gigabit networking, and eight M.2 2280 NVMe drive bays. Now, as of the recording of this video, it's listed for sale for $800 or $799. So, does it live up to the hype and the expectations of an eight bay all NVMe NAS? So come along on this adventure. Also, TerraMaster sent this unit to me for review. And no money changed hands, and they won't see the review until you do. So, without further ado, I got the box here. Let's see what's inside. Powerful, speedy, and quiet. By the way, they also call it a beast at one point. It seems like instructions, so... This one is instructions. It's the user manual, so trash can. Oh, there it is. It's pretty light, I'm going to say surprisingly small for fitting eight drives. Wow. So here is the little guy. It's, um, it's a little guy. Backside, they have a warranty sticker. I'll probably want to take that off. Come on, get out of there. Here on the actual back, so we have 12 volt in, HDMI, 10 gigabit ethernet, two USB type A's and a type C. These are all say 10 gig. Literally nothing on the front except my fingerprint. Fans on the bottom, so these little feet keep it, uh, just off the ground. So a single thumb screw here to loosen this. Oh, it's not captive. It uh, comes out. How does it come out? Oh. Pop it right open. That was really easy. This is the quickest I have been in a NAS, I think, ever. Single thumb screw, very simple. So this side of the board, we've got the NVMEs, so they're labeled. Well, that one's not labeled. Oh, there it is. NVMe 1, 2, 3, and 4. These all look like 2280s, pretty standard. We also have two RAM slots. Is this two RAM slots or one RAM slot? So the RAM is TerraMaster branded. I don't know if you can see that either, but the actual chips themselves are also TerraMaster branded. So I can't even tell you if these are like Micron or Samsung or whatever. So this is only a single memory slot. It's not dual channel memory. I mean, it's DDR5, so it's like two half channels. But it's only one stick that's not a second memory slot. So flipping the thing over, the other side looks like this is probably the CPU cooler. So this is not passive, the fans are just down there. And we have four more M.2s, and they're labeled 5, 6, 7, 8. So also inside of here, there's an internal USB port with a USB drive. And I'm going to guess this stores the TerraMaster operating system because that's what the other TerraMaster units are like. So I'll probably pull that out and test it with other operating systems later. So for drives today, I've got three 980s and a 970. These are all one terabyte. Um, three of them are PCIe Gen 4, and one is Gen 3. TerraMaster also included these nice NVMe heat sinks. There's a little box of them that came in the box. So I have eight heat sinks and thermal pads. So overall, this is a really compact unit and the hardware looks really simple. So now it's time to boot it up and see what their operating system is like. So I'm up here on my desktop. I just installed the TerraMaster OS TOS. TerraMaster does require that you install TOS onto your data drives. So that little tiny USB inside is just for the bootloader, so to speak. So now it wants to do a challenge to my email and I don't really want this box to go out to the internet and to know my email. I mean, I guess it might be helpful to receive alerts and stuff. But I'm trying to skip verification, it won't let me. Okay, so I put in my email. Now can I skip verification? Okay, there we go. Now we gotta create a storage pool. Now at the setup set I'm into the regular UI, they made it look kind of like a desktop in a web browser. They probably did that because Sology did that, but I think it's a poor choice for designing a settings UI. I mean you're not gonna log into your NAS every single day and edit your files on the NAS realistically. You're gonna access this remotely with normal file access tools or with dedicated apps. So kind of a weird choice, but I can see who they copied. So here's what I mean about the desktop. You get a bar on top that looks kind of like Windows 11, except on the top. We got Windows here in front of the Cheetah. We can make them big, we can make them small, and we have settings. And this is also kind of a interesting approach for settings, but I need to make a storage pool because I don't have any storage yet. So I come here and maximize this. This is kind of what I would expect a UI to look like in modern day. 
with sidebar, with access to stuff, this would be a perfectly nice looking UI. So anyway, let's make a storage pool. So I need some options up. The, uh, the window's not quite big enough. Uh, there we go. So my options, T-RAID, T-RAID Plus, JBOD, RAID 0, RAID 1, RAID 5, and RAID 6. Now, I intentionally put in some mismatched drives here. I've got four 1 terabytes and one 500 gig. So I want to see how it deals with mismatched drive sizes, because some people seem to try to do that a lot. I mean, realistically, in my opinion, if you're buying an 8-bay NVMe unit, you're probably going to be able to afford at least four new drives to put in it that are all the same size. So being able to mismatch 1 and 2 terabyte or... 500 gig and one terabyte doesn't seem like a terribly useful thing to me, but some people, I guess, buy their drives one at a time, which I would much rather just save up and buy the amount that I need to build the system correctly. So anyway, their proprietary T-RAID, it says that with my four and a half terabytes, I can get three and a half usable and one terabyte redundant. With T-RAID Plus, I get less. So I'm guessing T-RAID Plus is kind of like RAID 6, where I can lose up to two drives. With JBOD, I get the full storage. With RAID 0, I also get the full storage, so I'm not sure how these two are different. With RAID 5, it's wasting the upper 500 gigs of each drive, which makes sense. And with RAID 6, it's doing the same. So I already know that under the hood, TerraMaster is using Linux MD RAID for all of these RAID options. However, I wanted to see how they're doing their special sauce T-RAID that lets you mix and match different size drives. So I'm going to set this pool up specifically with T-RAID and also with ButterFS, just to kind of dig into that in Linux, how it's actually set up. Now, they're not using ButterFS native RAID, because ButterFS native RAID can lose data, which is a very true statement if you use RAID 5 or RAID 6 in ButterFS. However, doing RAID in MD isn't any better. So, food for thought. ZFS doesn't have this problem. ZFS does not lose data in RAID 5 or RAID 6. T-RAID, all my disks will be erased. Hey, go ahead. So now we finished creating a pool, now we can create a volume. we we'll call it my volume on storage pool one. We're going to use max capacity. We are not going to do hyperlock, but maybe I'll come back and try hyperlock. I'm going to use ButterFS because it's pretty good. It's not to say ButterFS is as good as ZFS, but it's pretty good. So I'll let it take a sweet time to format and I'll come back to you when it's done. So now that I got that array set up, I copied a big file onto it. And down here, I'm going to try to mount that file system on Linux to see how I can easily recover the data and what format they're using. Now, the only thing I have to test with is Debian 12. So we're going to boot up Debian 12 on the TerraMaster, pull out the internal TerraMaster USB and see what we can find. Here in the BIOS, by the way, it has this option called Toss Boot First, which we're going to turn off. That way we can boot whatever we want. Um, they have set themselves up as the two boot drives here. One of my drives already had Windows on it, so sorry about that. And then I have a generic flash drive, so we'll set that as first boot option. So it booted up here. So it looks like we have five NVMEs, that's correct. It looks like they're using LVM. So it mounted just fine. We got a folder called at. Looks like they are naming all of their internal folders with an at. So I guess um, public is what I want. There, in fact, is that file, A001C16, blah, blah, blah. Okay, looks like uh, MD125 is the TOS operating system. There's another one, TOS swap. So here we've got an array that is level 5, but it only has 4 devices, NVMe 0, 2, 3, and 4. How about 126? That one has all 5 devices. So I guess just like they said, they're doing a RAID across the bottom 500 gigs of 5 disks, and then another RAID across the top 500 gigs of the remaining 4 disks, and then mirroring those two together with LVM to get the total space. It's a neat trick for sure. Yeah, so we've got these two PVs merged with LVM. So the upper 500 gigs and lower 500 gigs. So t raid is just Linux MD, which makes perfect sense. It's just got a UI to set it up for you. So earlier, while setting up my storage volumes, I noticed they have an option for WORM. Now WORM stands for Write Once, Read Many. And it's commonly used in cases where you need to have like long-term periodic data integrity, mostly for audit purposes. So essentially on a WORM drive, you can write data to the drive and you can't delete it, it's stuck there forever. Now, usually when you do archival stuff in Worm, you do it on tape. They have special tapes which can't be overwritten. It can only be written once. Um, like CDs, classic CD-Rs, could not be rewritten, they can only be written. Those would be Worm, I guess, too. So anyway, I put yet another SSD in the TerraMaster, and we're going to see what that setup looks like. So I've got my existing storage pool, my existing volume. 
So I'm going to make a new one and create a new pool for my new volume. I'm going to use my 512 gig drive. We're going to use single disk. That's all I got. And enable hyperlock worm file system. Hit compliance mode and enterprise mode. So enterprise mode data cannot be deleted or modified during the protection period, which is 365 days. Compliance mode, it can never be deleted or modified. So we'll try compliance mode. It seems fun. So now Windows here, I can see my worms folder. Make a new text file. Well, that was fun. I could save it, so I saved that change. Oh, and it didn't save it, it just disappeared. Let's copy a new file on here. It does, in fact, have text. If I delete that text and I save it, it kind of locks up a little bit. It has locked up. So don't try to use a worm drive like as a daily driver. If you dump files on it, they're stuck forever. Windows will hate you, Notepad will hate you. You're gonna have some problems if you try to use it as your daily driver file system. That's not what's intended for, but uh, I thought it was a fun test anyway. So I'm back down here to look at the worm drives in Linux again. I once again booted up Debian. If you recall, the RAID arrays were done with MD and then merged with LVM. So you're doing RAID 5 with Linux MD RAID, which is a very common way to do it. And I expect something kind of similar, although you did single disk for this. So my guess is they're going to be using ext4 because that's a file system that does file system things. But I guess we'll see. Okay, so we have a worm here. I forgot to check what file system. So it looks like it is an XFS file system, which is an interesting choice. Well, here are my files converted from DOS format. Oh, hello. Well, I seem to have no problem saving it, so it's not worm on disk. So whatever they're doing for worm protection is done in TOS at the operating system level. Clearly not at the disk level or even the file system level. So this is a standard XFS file system on disk. It's obviously a standard disk, so if you pull the disk out, you can erase the disk. So I guess your security of your worm files is up to the security of TOS. Good to know. So worm seemed like a kind of neat idea, but really if you actually want long-term data security, what you probably want are snapshots. So essentially with snapshots, we take a snapshot of the data at periods of time, we can look back at our history of snapshots and see what a file was like at that point in time, and we can recover from it. Now, obviously you still need backups. Snapshots are not backups. What snapshots help protect you from is unintentional data deletion or modification. So you did something to the server on accident, and you wanna go back and look at your history. So in TOS, we can just install the snapshot app if we're using ButterFS. Okay, so let's set up some sort of schedule. I want to save my data folder. We're going to do it on a schedule. Let's see. Can I do it more than every day? Yeah, so we'll say every day. And we're going to do it every, looks like every one hour is my closest option. So we'll say every one hour. And retain up to 300 of them. So my next one will be, oh, I just missed it by one minute. Oh, wow. I'm we'll force to take one anyway. Okay, now we have a snapshot. So now looking at my file manager, I have a folder called at snapshot, which is cool. Can I get to that from Windows? So here's what it looks like in Windows. I manually type in at snapshot. No. So it is over here in file manager though. I go in here, I can see my snapshot. Come on. So overall, it sure seems like TOS, Terramaster's operating system, has all the functions you would expect from at least a basic network attached storage. It also supports Docker containers, a few other things I didn't explore, but the basics are certainly there, and if you want storage, NVMe, it's got you covered with the built-in software. But this is a relatively low-end processor, an Intel N305, and it has 10 gigabit ethernet, one port, 10 gig. So what I really want to understand is what is the link topology, and what sort of bandwidth do we have to all these drives, and can our little Intel N305 actually handle that? A bit of a spoiler, not really gonna handle that Gen 4 stuff. So here's what our PCIe topology looks like. So you can see we've got an Aquantia AQC113 NIC, that's NBase-T. 
Next, we've got four NVMe drives. I have no idea what slots they're in. They're connected directly to the CPU. And we've got four of them that are off of some sort of PCIe switch. So these PCI switches are the Asmedia 2806. The Quantra NIC is running at PCIe Gen 3 by two lanes. One of my NVMe's is running at Gen 3 by one lane. Got another Gen 3 by one lane. The PCI bridge has a Gen 3 by two uplink. One of the devices off the bridge is running at Gen 3 by one. So overall, it looks like four of the drives have Gen 3 by one lane directly to the CPU and four of the drives have Gen 3 by one lane to a PCI switch, and that switch has Gen 3 by two lanes to the CPU. Now this is not a whole lot of bandwidth, but if you have a low end CPU like an Intel N305, it is not gonna be able to do four lanes or even two lanes to eight drives. So this chip probably has nine lanes. I guess I'll put up the Intel Arc page on this. And if it has nine lanes, they're giving two of them to the 10 gig card, two of them to the PCI switch, and four of them to the four NVMe drives. That leaves us one lane left over. There is an unpopulated spot on the board for another network card, and I'm guessing that was what the uh, ninth lane was gonna be for. So overall, what do I think of the F8 SSD NAS? Holding it in my hand now, it's pretty light. The enclosure is entirely plastic. It's perfectly fine if it works well. At the bottom, we have two fans. These cool the entire thing. There's a heat sink for the CPU. It comes with eight heat sinks for the eight NVMe's. So off to a good start there. Super easy to take apart. Just one screw out the back, whole thing comes right out. Now, I think if you're intending on getting eight NVMe drives for their bandwidth, you'll be disappointed. This has an Intel N305. It is not going to be blazing fast. Two NVMe drives will max out essentially the PCIe throughput and the 10 gig throughput. Um, but each drive only gets one lane at best. And four of the drives are on a PCIe switch with a two lane uplink. So the drive bandwidth is quite low. Now, of course, if you're getting NVMe's for their power efficiency or you don't actually plan on putting in eight of them, that's also perfectly fine. If you don't put in eight of them though, your bandwidth across the CPU is not gonna be maxed out. You need at least six to max that out. But again, 10 gig networking is a lot slower than eight or even six or even four NVMe SSDs. So maybe you don't need that anyway. Operating system. TerraMaster's operating system is very functional. It does everything it needs to do for a NAS. You can configure settings, users, shares, stuff like that and it works just fine for that. You can, of course, also install your own operating system. You have to go into the BIOS, you have to pull the USB key out so it doesn't boot into that, at least that's what I found. Once I pulled the USB key out of the inside, which is, of course, very easy to do with the one screw to get the housing out, then I booted up, mashed the delete key, turned off, boot into TOS first, or whatever it was called, and got Linux running. Yeah, so of course, being an ass, this is very sparse on external I.O., which you would expect from a network device. So we have our 10 gig that we love, we have HDMI, which we honestly wouldn't need except to install Linux. We have two USB 3s and a USB Type-C, which is also USB 3. It's not Thunderbolt. And pretty much these are going to be used for external drives or installing Linux. I guess you could plug in extra stuff to this, but it's not really what it's meant for. So hardware-wise, this is probably one of the simplest boards I've ever seen in a small form factor like this that I've reviewed. It's not like so small that they had to really squish everything in. There's plenty of space for the eight NVMe's, four on each side. Only one stick of RAM, which is not a deal, but it's also the max the N305 can handle. So it is what it is. The board is obviously extremely custom. It does not look like it would be hard to make your own case, but I don't know why you'd really want to. It, uh, it's a pretty small case anyway. So this thing is built like a value NAS. It doesn't have the CPU performance to run high-end virtual machines or things like that. You can probably run containers successfully on the N305 and be happy with them. You're not gonna get the IO bandwidth of eight drives like you'd expect. But also, if you bought this with 10 gig, you're probably not expecting more than 10 gig of bandwidth. So I think that's a reasonable choice. The PCI switch is a bit slow, but they don't have any other options with the N305. They would have had to go to a higher end CPU, which also would have been nice to see given the performance of modern NVMe drives. But this is pretty much built for consumers. And for that, I think it's pretty fine. So those are my thoughts. If you want to buy one, I have a link down below in the description. Um, I have a Discord server if you want to follow me, link down below for that. I have a Kofi if you want to give me any tips, I greatly appreciate them. And as always, I'll see you guys on the next adventure.